Welcome, my friends, to Scott Marlowe's Creature Zone. My special guests and I will take a look at things that go bump in the night from a scientific perspective. Join us now as we delve deep into myth, legend, and folklore to uncover the truth about creatures that science would prefer to forget or ignore. Welcome, my friends, to Scott Marlowe's Creature Zone. My special guests and I will take a look at things that go bump in the night from a scientific perspective. Join us now as we delve deep into myth, legend, and folklore to uncover the truth about creatures that science would prefer to forget or ignore. Good evening. Creature Zone fans, this is your host, Scott Marlowe, and I have a special guest tonight, Scott Martis. And Scott is an expert on uh, lake monsters and is currently on expedition up in Lake Champlain and is joining us from the field. And uh, how are you doing tonight, Scott? Fine, Scott. How are you? I'm doing terrific, thanks. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, tell us a little bit about Champ Camp and uh, what you guys are doing up there. Well... We were there at Button Bay, which is a, a bay of Lake Champlain near Bridgens. We were out in a boat uh, doing water testing to try to find out information about the uh, ecosystem in Button Bay and also listening for sounds of possibly the champ animals with hydrophones, and we also deployed two underwater cameras. Um, one of them was baited with exotic bait, uh, crab meat and uh, clams, in the hopes that it might attract these animals to come into something that's not normally on the menu. And uh, the organization is uh, out of Chaplin, Connecticut, <clears throat> formerly called Believe It Tours. They're going under the name Bright Yellow now, and the two founders are Michael and Diana Assorti. He has a degree, I believe, in graphic design from the Rhode Island School of uh, Design, and she is a microbiologist that has formerly worked with uh, a company that made medical devices in California, and I think she's also done water testing for the state of California. So um, she, uh, she was doing most of the... Um, chemical work on the lake, and uh, the other members of the team, besides those two, are William Draginis, and he's an aerospace engineer with Northrop Grumman, and he created most of the uh, technology, the underwater cameras and the hydrophones, and the other person involved was Jeff Muse, who is the co-director of Warren Coleman's Cryptozoology Museum in Maine. So we all come with... Uh, pretty good pedigrees. I have no formal training in biology, but I am a former volunteer worker at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia in the vertebrate paleontology department back in the early 1990s. I'm also a former sustaining member of the defunct International Society of Cryptozoology. And uh, I also co-authored with Dr. Elizabeth von Muggenthaler a scientific abstract about the echolocation sounds recorded in 2003 in Lake Champlain for the Acoustical Society of America. Cool. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, why the interest in Champ? With all the other lake monsters and you know that we have around the world, uh, well, why are you, well, why are you focusing on Champ? Well, my original love was Nessie and. I just didn't think it was practical 
I just didn't think I could afford to move to Scotland, but I could afford to move from Philadelphia to Vermont. So it was more or less a matter of convenience. But uh, Champ, if you look at the the evidence, the quality of the evidence from most of the Lake Monster Lakes, the quality of the evidence from Lake Champlain is actually a notch above most of them. You know, I would say probably Champ and Nessie have the most um, intriguing evidence, photographic and otherwise, connected to them, in my opinion. Gotcha. How about Lake Okanagan and uh, Ogopogo? Oh, it's very credible as well. Um, I haven't had a chance to uh, make it to uh, British Columbia. I've been to Canada, but I've been only up into uh, Quebec and Ontario. I'd love to go investigate Okanagan Lake someday when it's convenient. Well, that would make two of us. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Probably, oh. probably, in my opinion, the most credible evidence for the Ogopogo are the Folden film from 1968 and Larry Tall's um, film from 1980 have always been the most impressive to me. Cool. Yeah. Boy, these woods sure are spooky. The Headless Horseman is supposed to be on the prowl here. There he is! Whoa! Hit the deck! He's coming back! Duck! <laughs> These things happen when you don't tune in to Creature Zone here on Pangea Radio, www.pangeainstitute.us. And we're back with our special guest, Scott Martis, and we're talking about lake monsters tonight. Uh, and this is especially uh, appropriate tonight because Scott's actually at uh, Lake Champlain doing research on Champ, uh, the uh, uh, legendary lake monster from that lake and that area of the world. So what have you guys found, if anything? Well, <clears throat> so far, we have not had a real chance to completely analyze the uh, photographs from the underwater camera. They were down for like two days, and it was set to take um, pictures every 10 seconds. So, Wow, that's a lot of pictures. Absolutely. So what we've got to do... There, there are two AVI files, you know, almost like if you if you look at it as a video, it's like watching a time lapse, you know, mm -hmm. image. So what we've got to do, um, it's actually dependent for me to get back to Florida where I live to use my main computer. I have a program that can take a video file and chop it down into stills. So as soon as I get back to Florida on the 6th of August, I'm going to take the two AVI files from the underwater camera and convert them to stills and go through them. So we're waiting for me to get back to do that. Now, cool. the hydrophone equipment that Will brought with him, <clears throat> we're kind of, you know, limited on budget. We've done the best we could do um, technology-wise, but... Um, the echolocation sounds recorded by Liz von Muggenthaler in 2003 were up to 144 kilohertz, which is very high frequency. And among animals, usually sounds that high are associated with echolocation, such as high frequency echolocation uh, from bats and whales, toothed whales. Uh, the problem with the hydrophones we were using is that they were only set to record up to 44.1 kilohertz. Now, I'm not sure exactly how this works because I am not a bioacoustician, but whatever your recorder will record up to, you are actually only able to, rec to sample sounds up to half the maximum frequency. In other words, if you're using a recorder, that records up to 44.1 kilohertz, you're actually only going to be able to get sounds at 22 kilohertz, which is half of that. <clears throat> when Dr. Von Muggenthaler was recording her sounds in 2003, 
she had a digital audio tape recorder that would record up to the same frequency as I'm talking about for the hydrophones we just used last week. But in addition to that, she had a digital workstation with an audio card, a uh, PCMCIA board that was able to sample up to 200 kilohertz. So in other words, she was able to get an audio uh, audible signal that a, the human ear could hear with the digital audio tape. But beyond the frequencies that the human ear can hear were only registered on the digital audio workstation with that board. And the really super high frequencies you could only see on a, on a, a graph, you know. And in other words, it's beyond, it's like a dog whistle. It's beyond the range of human hearing. So the only part that you could actually hear is the, the lower frequency part, you know, which was uh, up to the 22 kilohertz, which sounds like, you know, like a clicking sound, almost like the sound of a, a fishing rod clicking or something. So, or, you know, or dolphins with echolocation. Exactly, exactly. That's what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. So anyway, you know, we were limited. We, we, were, we, we knew going into it we wouldn't be able to hear um, the high frequency component, but we were hoping to hear the lower frequency component and at least confirm that, right? Mm -hmm. So we go out in the button bay and about 30 feet of water <clears throat> and deploy the hydrophones. Now, last year we had hydrophones in 2013 at button bay, but they were not set up to record. But as we were going out last year, I was able to hear what I thought sounded like the echolocation sounds in fairly shallow water, but, but we couldn't record it. So anyway, jumping ahead to this year, this would have been last Saturday, we were out in 30 feet of water with the hydrophones on, and I suddenly hear echolocation-like clicking sounds. And I'm listening, and I'm listening, and I'm thinking, what could possibly be causing this? You know, uh, a conventional answer. So I happen to look over, and we've left the fish finder on, you know, that sends out a, a sonar pulse to find fish. And I tell Will, go over there and turn the echo, uh, the fish finder off. So he did, and then it disappeared. You know, so in that one instant, that particular what we thought was echolocation was actually just a fish finder. Whether, you know, the, all of them are that, we just don't know. There's no way of, uh, in other words, without equipment to read the higher frequency, we can't completely rule that out as being the sound, you know. In other words, we don't have the high frequency equipment at this point to be able to distinguish between a fish finder and a high frequency echolocation signal from a whale or something like that. Anyway, uh, separate from that, after we had turned off the echolocation, uh, the uh, fish finder, Will uh, took a turn listening on the hydrophones and he said he thought he heard some kind of a clicking sound. And that would not have been our fish finder. Whether that was a fish finder from another boat, I don't know. It could have been possibly that, or it could have been some kind of animal echolocating. So that's the status yeah. of that. I mean, it's yeah. You know, just to just just to help our our listeners along, because some may not be as technologically uh, astute as as uh, to, to deal with the language. Uh -huh. When we're talking uh -huh. about echolocation here. Uh, we're talking about the equivalent of, of biological sonar. Exactly. Uh, it's it's like, a sound that an animal emits that is yep. reflected back to it Yep. Uh, yep. so that it is able to sense prey or other animals in its vicinity. Exactly. The way it works with whales, with toothed whales, with advanced echolocation, they normally have what is called a sonar melon, which is a pad of fat <clears throat> that sits on their forehead. They send out a sound, a high-frequency sound, focused through that melon. The sound goes out, hits an object, comes back, hits, they hear uh, 
on their lower jaw, they have their ear bones are actually in a, encased in a sort of uh, casing of fat in the lower jaw. That's where the sound comes back. Then they take the sound that they hear and process it in their brain or are able to get spatial information from the returning sound. In other words, they're able to see sort of a sound picture in their brain of whatever object the sound hit and bounced back to. I mean, you know, <coughs> since, yes. we, since we don't have the ability to do this, we can only talk about it in abstract terms, if you follow me. Sure. You know, so, so we can only... But in, a, but in effect, it's, it's their way with the kind of, of underwater hearing they have. Yeah. Of being able to gauge distance by, Absolutely. in our case, it's, we do it by loudness. Yeah. In their case, they do it by do it in the time frequency uh, that the exactly. sound bounces back. Exactly. The shorter yeah. the shorter the time it takes it to get back, that tells them that the object is closer to them or farther away from them. And it, it's apparently, you know, they, uh, it's imagined that it's much more sophisticated than that, and that they can kind of get like a three dimensional audio picture. Of some sort, which mm-hmm. you know, it's it's like being able to see in the dark, essentially. Which they're down in the deep water where sunlight doesn't penetrate. Of course, you know, it, it'd be the, the closest equivalent they could probably have to seeing in the dark. Very cool. Yeah, it's a nice absolutely. adaptation. Yeah, and the interesting thing about the possibility of these animals being able to echolocate is this goes back to you know, like Roy Mackel's idea of Champ and the Loch Ness Monster being some kind of primitive whale along the lines of a Bacillosaurus or perhaps a little bit more advanced. And it's a known fact that Lake Champlain was once a marine embayment called the Champlain Sea about 10,000 years ago. And they have found numerous, at least 21, uh, beluga whale skeletons from that time of beluga whales that inhabited the Champlain Sea. So the idea is, is is it's possible that some kind of uh, beluga or some other cetacean may have adapted to fresh water and persisted, and that is what we call the Lake Champlain monster. Very good. Well, that's an interesting theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I know most people would prefer to think of Nessie and Champ and some of the others as being uh, plesiosaur-type animals, but actually mm-hmm. the... Uh, amount of evidence that has amassed is kind of leading completely away from that that paradigm. Well, oddly enough that you should mention that, the plesiosaur is actually my favorite candidate. And there is no fossil evidence to support the idea that plesiosaurs from 65 million years ago echolocated. But given an additional 65 million years of hidden evolution, who's to say that perhaps a modern-day plesiosaur could not echolocate? You know, it's not impossible. Well, and it, they, they, there's the fossil evidence we have a little problem with, because uh, the plesiosaur is actually a European and, uh, and, and some other, other uh, areas of the world uh, is in the fossil record there. Uh, in the Americas, the plesiosaur isn't found, and its cousin, the elasmosaur. Well, the, yeah, uh, well, when I speak uh, of plesiosaurs, I'm yeah. talking about the whole group. I'm talking about mm-hmm. the, the cryptoclides, the plesiosaurs, the elasmosaurs, even the pliosaurs. They were all plesiosaurs. Yeah. Right. You know, so, well, yeah. Or they were of that family, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, yes. if, you, if, you, if you consider the whole group, they have been found everywhere all over the world. And yes. they have a fossil record spanning 130 million years. And they've been found everywhere from the North Pole to the South Pole. So, you know. Well, they had a they had uh, as a rule an elephantine body yes. uh, with gigantic yeah. flippers that uh, mm-hmm. each worked independently. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And a very long neck. Uh, mm-hmm. The elasmosaur had uh, more of a uh, I don't want to say crocodilian because that's actually exaggerating it too much, mm-hmm. but a, an elongated yeah. snout, whereas. Uh, the plesiosaur was a little bit more turtle-like in their, their yes. head configuration. Yes, yes. Well, you know, um, the echolocation evidence itself would point strongly towards some sort of cetacean. But the eyewitness accounts and the photographic evidence 
far more heavily supports the plesiosaur idea. Yes. Morphologically. So, you know, whatever we're dealing with here, if, if the photographs and the majority of the eyewitness reports are correct, they suggest an animal that at least vaguely resembles a plesiosaur. That may not be what it is. We may be dealing with a case of convergent evolution, but then again, it, it actually could be some kind of evolved plesiosaur. You know, we just don't know yet. Okay, with that, we're going to take another break. Hang on a second, mm -hmm. and we will be right back with Scott Martis. Hey, monster fans, tune in to Creature Zone on the Radio Aware Network. I'm your host, Scott Marlowe. My special guests and I take a serious look at things that go bump in the night from a scientific perspective. Join us each week as we delve deep into myth, legend, and folklore to uncover the truth about creatures that science would prefer to forget or ignore. Okay, we're back with uh, our guest, Scott Martis, uh, who's up at Lake Champlain uh, doing some research on lake monsters. And uh, so uh, what else has happened in the last week, Scott? You've been up there. Well, uh, the team left on Sunday, and I'm here till the 6th of August, so I'm working on some kind of solo projects. One thing I've been working on over the last couple of days is I had my own champ sighting in Burlington back in July of 1994. When it happened, I watched it through binoculars, but I did not have a camera. So I've been going back to the place where I had my sighting at Battery Park in Burlington, trying to get photographs of the area that I had my sighting in to try to resolve the exact uh, location and distance I'm going to take what I've got on the photographs and coordinate it with maps and GPS and try to figure out exactly how far away the animal was when I saw it. Cool. What that's, I saw, uh, that's been an interesting project. Yeah. Um, and this weekend I'm going up to St. Albans, Vermont, trying to locate the location of where Sandra Monzi took her photograph in 1977 up around St. Yes, Albans that, Bay and north of there. <clears throat> yes, I'll have to see if we can find a, a, a copy of that that we can post to the website for the viewers mm -hmm. of that particular photo. But as I recall, that's the one that has the uh, pronounced head that is not in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. And, it looks like yeah. a long neck and a snake-like head, and it looks like it's yes. looking over its back backwards mm -hmm. to the right. Yeah. Hopefully I, we uh, can find it find a copy of that photo that we're allowed to, to reproduce. Yeah, I, I tried to do some work on that last summer, and I did photograph a location that was very similar, but not exact. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a group, a Yahoo group called Champ Trackers, and one of the members of that group, Chris Jones, has sent me, I'm not sure where he got this information, but he has actually sent me latitude, longitude coordinates of where he believes the photograph may have been taken. And I'm going to use those with Google Earth, and there's also some street names involved in it as well, and I'm going to try to work on that over the weekend. And well, that's maybe, great. Maybe that will put me closer to the actual location. Yeah, so that, well, for the benefit of our listeners, too, we should mention that uh, you're on Facebook if anybody needs to hook yes. up with you. And uh, that, I, uh, that yeah, I think you were also a member of the group, the Zombie uh, uh, Plesiosaur Society, aren't you? Absolutely. I have I have three yes. Facebook pages that I started. The the original one was Lake Champlain Mystery Animals, which I started back I think 2011. And then I started up two new ones, the Zombie Plesiosaur Society, and then there's a sub page from that called the Ghost Plesiosaur Society, and what the Ghost Plesiosaur Society is about is for people who think there may be something other than uh, simply a biological answer to this. In other words, the Ghost Plesiosaur page is for people who think there may be a paranormal element to this. I personally 
believe that these animals are strictly biological in nature and that there is nothing paranormal about them. But there are people out there, including some very good friends of mine, that, that think they may be what you call zooforms, which are some sort of paranormal entity that appears to be an animal but is not. So Yeah, we, we, we hear that very frequently in Bigfoot them too. <laughs> oh absolutely, yeah. You know, which it's fine, you know, if you want to believe that and, and you think that's the way to go, fine. I have no problem with it. I, it's just not something that I personally subscribe to myself. So in other words, I'm trying to keep no no when I call this the zombie plesiosaur society, I'm not talking about zombies like you see in the horror movies. I'm talking about the term zombie taxa, which is a term the paleontologists used to describe uh, when fossils of an animal that is supposed to be extinct pop up in younger sediments. It is referred to as a zombie taxa. In other words, an animal that's supposed to be extinct still wandering around or swimming around in the case of plesiosaurs, if you think they're still around. So that's why which I would, chose that would... name. Sure, and I understand. Yeah, so, yeah. The, so again, so that our listeners do follow you. So, in other words, if a dinosauria fossil were to be found above the KT boundary, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It would be classified as a zombie. Uh, yeah, a zombie commonly, creature. the common term most people are, are used to in, in paleontology circles is reworked fossils. In other mm -hmm. words, they were through some process were reworked out of their original sediments into younger sediments. And uh, that's very important to me because there just so happens to be quite a bit of so-called reworked plesiosaur material spanning from the Paleocene period through the Pleistocene Ice Ages. And there's quite a lot of it, too. Um, and, you know, like I said, the, generally the paleontologists consider this stuff reworked, but uh, there is some dinosaur material from New Mexico that is currently being debated as to whether these fossils are reworked or they're actual Paleocene dinosaurs that survived the um, meteorite impact. So if that argument can be extended to these dinosaur fossils in New Mexico, perhaps it could also be extended to this post-KT plesiosaur material as well. Well, they're now saying that there's a pretty good chance that uh, many dinosaurs did survive uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the cometary uh, collision, mm -hmm. but were later done in by a series of very very bad luck issues. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, uh, you know, that uh, you know chain of events was set into motion that uh, eventually yeah. did them all in. There's a but term that for that. Also... They call it they call it dead clade walking. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but that would also open up the door uh, if that concept is correct, uh, that there may be some pockets uh, around the world, uh, mastiffs uh, high in the mountains and other mm -hmm. very inaccessible areas that humans have not been to or uh, have been to very infrequently, yeah. that uh, could potentially uh, have supported uh, supposedly extinct life for some time after mm -hmm. their cohorts uh, met their demise. Absolutely. The, the, the best example I can think of that comes to mind uh, regarding dinosaurs is the Moki Limabimbi in the Congo. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and then there's a, supposedly a counterpart in South America, uh, which uh, has been reported on a number of occasions. And, I think and, I know what you're uh, talking you know, about. I, I can't think of the yeah. name of it, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 And uh, well, it might make a good trivia question that we'll have to ask one day that... Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah. yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so, and so, not not all of the the dinosauria that may have survived, like the Mokeli, uh are the large sauropods. Some oh, of them no. are oh. are different. Yeah, uh, yeah they yeah. might also be still four legged, but they're not. Uh, yeah. they're not of the the gigantic. Uh, well, oh, I don't want to use the word brontosaur, but everybody knows what I'm talking about. There are also reports of relics. Two, yep. two legged dinosaurs, theropod type dinosaurs yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, you just don't hear about them as much. No, but they're kind of fun. Uh, you know, oh, I like. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been out to New Mexico, but there's a a great little resort out there called uh, the Ghost Ranch. And mm, I think uh, if I've heard about this. 
Yeah, if they'll give you a permission, there's a little canyon uh, that's on the property that if you go out to that canyon, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, coelacanth. Uh, not coelacanth, excuse me. Uh, um, oh, good Lord. Now my mind is gone completely blank. Uh, well, they're like velociraptors, except that this would have been the the predecessor. Something uh, like maybe Compsognathus or Troodon. Uh, or? No, Compies were smaller. These are mm. these would be much larger, about the size of a large turkey with a very long neck mm. and very long legs. Uh, mm. So kind of sort of uh, the same size, but not quite as big as an ostrich. Mm. Uh, uh, but definitely a theropod. Of, oh, okay, theropods. Yes. yes, I've heard of theropods. Yes. Yes, uh, yeah, and they, so they've, got, they've got triassic, all kinds uh, of fossils out there. Yeah, yes. that's cool. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, actually, that was one of the first two-legged dinosaurs. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, it, you know, of course, I'm a real fossil hound, so uh, mm -hmm. you know, that when you get into the fossil stuff, I just love that thing. Oh, absolutely. I love doing that. But, uh, so, you know, if you're in New Mexico, you might want to stop by this place and see if they'll give you permission because you, oh, you'd absolutely. enjoy it. I've heard, of, I've heard of the Ghost yeah. Ranch. In fact, I think there's a book about it, too. Uh, there may be. Uh, it's so. pretty well known for its retreats, but, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, a lot of very interesting things there. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Basically, basically, where I'm coming from, I'm, I'm working on trying to sort of validate the idea that was originally proposed by Constance White and later expanded upon by Tim Dinsdale, the idea that plesiosaurs may have survived their presumed extinction in the deep ocean and managed to continue to, to live and evolve out in the deep ocean for a period of 65, 64 million years, then you jump up to the Ice Age, approximately between 12,500 years ago and 10,000 years ago, when the glaciers melted and places like Loch Ness and Lake Champlain became temporary arms of the sea. There was a short window where the ice melted and flooded, raised the sea level enough to where the seas invaded these places. But this was before isostatic rebound. And what I mean by that was that the continental plates had been weighed down by the weight of the glaciers. And it took time for them to recover from that and bounce back up. So there was a brief window of, say, maybe 2,500 years generally where these places were connected to the sea but the land had not rebounded to the point where it cut off the marine influence and made these waters fresh water. So the idea is that perhaps small colonies of plesiosaurs came into places like Loch Ness and Lake Champlain, and then at some point the land rose and they were cut off, and they either had to adapt to fresh water or die. Now... There are fish living in Lake Champlain right now, such as the rainbow smelt and the landlocked Atlantic salmon and even the sea lampreys, that genetic evidence says that these fishes are relics from the marine Champlain Sea that adapted to fresh water. So given the fact that in Lake Champlain you, you've got fossils of large marine mammals of whales and seals, the idea is is that in addition to these fishes that have adapted to fresh water, there is something larger, a fish predator, that has also adapted, and we just haven't found them yet. So that's basically the, the way I'm going. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a plesiosaur. It could be, you know, a some sort of freshwater adapted primitive whale or some kind of weird fish, you know. We just don't know yet. But I understand that they've discovered that Loch Ness still has an under underground uh, passage to the ocean. Or to mm, the sea. I'm, I, I've heard stories, but I'm not aware of any confirmation of that. Yeah, I, do know, I, I know that uh, one of our, I know that at least one of our, our wayward Florida manatees makes it all the way up to Lake Champlain every year. Oh, absolutely! And, uh, yes, Chelsea the manatee. I've heard about that yes. several times. Um, yep. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh. There has been confirmation that Loch Ness definitely was connected to the sea 
between 12,800 years ago and 14,000 years ago because they have found marine invertebrate fossils that have been radiocarbon dated to that time in the blue clay on the bottom of Loch Ness in Urquhart Bay. Bob yeah. Rines and his people discovered them in 2003 or 2004, I think 2003. But that has been confirmed. So they do know that, that Lake that Loch Ness definitely was connected to the sea around the same time as the Champlain Sea existed. So, uh, you know, we mentioned, uh, uh, we talked a good bit about Cham Lake Champlain and Ness. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, let's let's talk a little bit about some of these other uh, lake monsters. For example, mm -hmm. uh, Lake Tahoe. Tahoe uh, at one, yeah. Yes, and I understand at one time Jacques Cousteau went down uh, and took a look, and when he came back up, he was obviously shaken and was asked a question about what he had seen, and he said something to the effect of, uh, the public is not ready to know what I've seen. I've heard that story, too. I don't know exactly the origin of it, but I do have some information on the background, the geological history of uh, Lake Tahoe, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Fill us in. Okay, yeah. Lake Tahoe sits on the California-Nevada border. Now, Lake Tahoe and some other lakes that are right on the border on either side of California or Nevada in the same area, there's Lake Tahoe, Walker Lake, Pyramid Lake, and Mono Lake. All of these lakes are remnants of a much larger Ice Age lake that was called Lake Lahontan. So it's interesting that all these lakes that are relic portions of Lake Lahontan all have monster stories connected with them. Indian legends either talking about monsters or giant fish. And in addition to that, that area of Nevada, it, there are a lot of ichthyosaur fossils found there. Yes. Yeah, so, so at one time, at least during the Triassic, that was was under underwater. Now, that's a long time yeah. to go from the Ice Age to the Triassic. But in addition to that, there are some anomalous fossils found in California of ichthyosaurs that are assumed to have been reworked, but they were found in Pleistocene gravels, which would essentially be either right before or during the Pleistocene Ice Ages. So if you, if, if you consider the idea that perhaps these quote, reworked ichthyosaur fossils are not reworked and are actually from the Pleistocene, this may have a connection with what people are seeing in uh, Lake Tahoe and these other lakes, too. I'm just not sure. But yeah, it's a, lot, a lot of people were unaware of the fact that uh, much of the central United States uh, and almost all of the state of Texas uh, was actually underwater at one time. Oh, absolutely. The Western Interior Seaway during the yep. Cretaceous. Yeah. It went all the way from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to the Arctic and basically split the United States and North America, actually, in two. Yeah, as I, mm -hmm. I know that uh, I've gone fossil hunting out there near Dallas and have uh, mm -hmm. uh, found all kinds of, of, of marine-type fossils, crinoids, mosasaur bones, and vertebra, oh, cool. uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, ammonites? Yes. Yeah, well, yes, so definitely ammonites. Yeah. Cool. Uh, you know, there's been. I've got a pretty good collection of ammonites from around the world, but from that area too. And uh, so it's there's some really good fossil hunting in many of these areas. Absolutely. Uh, also, one of the uh, one of the lakes, uh, uh, although it's all dried up now, uh, there was an enormous lake in uh, north central uh, Nevada hmm. that uh, is associated with our our friends, the red haired giants. Hmm. Uh, and, and that's uh, not this, Lake Lahontan. No, and that's huh. uh, that they call them the Sateca, which basically hmm. has to do with these uh, these animals or these uh, uh, primitive humans mm -hmm. living uh, living in the lake and uh, e uh, using the lake reeds as uh, uh, you know a, a technological tool uh, hmm. to uh, build rafts and uh, you know their uh, all that other stuff wow. that uh, they would have uh, done with them. So yeah. yeah uh, so you're yeah, talking about like the Nephilim, right? Yeah. Well, no, I don't want to get into that because I don't, I, hmm. I don't buy the Nephilim story at all. Hmm. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the 
the, you know, the, the fact that the giants had red hair mm-hmm. may or may not be significant. It depends yeah. on how old the skeletal remains are. Because yeah, but, with age, yeah. uh, hair has a tendency to go reddish anyway. I've read about uh, this because they found so, red-haired Chinese mummies too. Yes, yes, yeah. they did. They, they could be related. We don't know until the DNA is done on them. Now, the giant but, shelters uh, you're talking about, did they have double rows of teeth and six fingers? Some, and... Of, them had double denti- some of them had double dentition, yes. Mm. Uh, well, that's, that's and, the uh, story that I, I, I've heard about the Nephilim is that they had red-haired, red-haired giants with six fingers and double rows of teeth. No, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I just don't buy the biblical stuff. So. Oh well, I'm not uh, saying, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. perhaps the biblical stories were inspired by something that was real, you know. That's I, possible, I know. but we're yeah. also getting off topic, and that's something I for understand. another night. Yes. So uh, we want to bring it back to the lake, uh, lake monsters. But in any case, uh, you know, there are many places, uh, and actually, uh, you know, talking about lake and sea monsters per se. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that uh, that is coming to light now is that there are several places in, on the planet where the rising water levels uh, that occurred with uh, you know, global melting and, and the, the freezing, uh, yeah. you know, had something to do with some of the flood stories. Oh, absolutely. For example, yeah. the Mediterranean at the uh, at the Pillars of Hercules or the uh, uh, Rock of Gibraltar was essentially a landlocked. Uh, large lake, if you will, mm-hmm. that when the Atlantic rose to the point that it could breach the uh, the the, um, the Gibraltar Straits, yeah. it flooded yeah. that entire area. Mm-hmm. So there's many, many, many uh, uh, relics, uh, artifacts, archaeological sites that are underwater in the Mediterranean because mm-hmm. of this. Oh, absolutely. Well, and you the, know, the same thing apparently happened at the uh, Black Sea. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the with Bosporus, yeah. and then again, yeah. and now they're saying that Eden is actually under the Gulf of Aqaba, I think it is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, in uh, the Arabia, because uh, at, the, at the Arabian Straits, mm-hmm. the same thing happened there, and uh, the whole area Do you was know flooded. the story of uh, the channeled scab lands and the Brett's floods out in Washington State? No, I hadn't heard that one. Okay. <clears throat> where Flathead Lake exists now, uh, after the Ice Age, after the glacial melting, there was a huge glacial lake called Glacial Lake Missoula that was dammed in by an ice dam. It was humongous. Mm-hmm. Anyway, at some point, I think 8,000 years ago, the ice dam finally broke, and it flooded all the way from Washington State um, to the mouth of the Columbia River, <clears throat> and the the path that it left left this place in Washington State called the Channel Scablands that looks like it's been blasted with a nuclear bomb. And what yeah. it is was the, this unbelievable amount of water rushing from Montana all the way to the Pacific Coast. And that was that's, that's a intriguing because I've heard a similar thing with uh, the Laurentine Ice Shelf uh, that would would have been up over top of uh, 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 Chicago, uh, you know that area, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, that's actually what uh, started the Mississippi River. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there were definitely there's there's <clears throat> tons of evidence <clears throat> of glacial meltwater floods from all over the world that could have very easily started, you know, the the stories of a global flood among, yeah. you know, not just the early um, Christians, but also, um, you know, there's a similar legend in Greek mythology, and I think right. the Mesopotamians had a story very similar, you know. Yeah, the uh, East mm. Indians did too. Uh, you know, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, tells a flood story. Mm-hmm. So yeah. anyway, uh, but that, that also brings up this really interesting thing with so much water around the planet, uh, you know, and wildlife being in the water. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some of these things could easily have gotten trapped uh, in, into uh, you know, the uh, environs 
and yeah. uh, as you say, adapted to uh, to being either freshwater creatures or they were all along, mm -hmm. and they're still there. Yep. But probably not many of them, but maybe they've managed to hold on, you know, at least. They may be in the process of going extinct. Who knows? There may be three of them in Lake Champlain right now, the last three. We just don't know. We don't have enough data to go on yet. <clears throat> So, all right, well, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, mm -hmm. So what have you got coming up? What are your plans for the next, uh, oh, I, you know, next couple of months? Well, I've got some several writing projects, you know, related to what we've been doing on the lake <clears throat> that I want to get put together. And um, one special project I want to work on over the winter is that at uh, – <clears throat> Lake Storjan in Sweden, home of the Storjigerat, there is a museum in Jantlands on the lake shore that claims to have an embryo of the Storjan monster in a in a jar preserved. As near as I've been able to find out, this was allegedly discovered and put in the jar in 1895 but not donated to the museum until sometime in 1984 or 1985. I've only seen photographs, but what you see of it looks pretty intriguing. It looks like maybe it's about two or three feet long and has flipper-like appendages and a sort of a pseudo plesiosaur looking head, but it's hard to tell through the jar, you know, with the glass and everything. Mm -hmm. So... The project that I want to work on over the winter is to try to make some kind of arrangements with the museum that's satisfactory with them and to have some biologist actually go over there and examine this thing and figure out what it is through DNA or whatever comparative anatomy processes, you know, that can be done. Cool. But I think it really needs to be looked at. Uh, have you heard that there's a similar thing uh, or a similar exhibit? I don't know if a museum has it or not, but I seem to remember a friend of mine, Corey Chemko, telling me that uh, uh, they had something like that with uh, Ogopogo. Hmm. Well, now, during the Monster Quest episode, there was what was thought to have been some kind of a baby aborted fetus found near uh, Squally Point, but they brought it back and examined it and did a DNA test, and it turned out to be a salmon. Uh, but I don't know if that's the same thing that you're talking about here. Uh, no, you know, I seem to remember seeing a picture of it, and it sure didn't look like a salmon. Huh. Uh, well, maybe, so. maybe what you're thinking of is the alleged baby monster from Lake Erie, which was taxidermied by the by this guy that claimed to have found it. And it looked like a little plesiosaur with little um, ridges going down its tail. Does that sound no, familiar? No, I don't think I've seen that, no. Yeah. Well, um, that's controversial. That, that's actually been studied um, and DNA tested at Texas A&M University back in the early 2000s. And the problem with it was that the taxidermy solvent apparently contaminated the DNA to the point where they couldn't get a usable sample to identify uh, it. But it's still kind of up in the air, but one theory about it is that it's possibly a burbot fish, which is also known as a ling cod, that has been purposely manipulated by the taxidermist to look like a plesiosaur. But, you know, like I said, it's still up in the air. The the people that have it, the Creation uh, Evidences Museum in Glen Rose, Texas, say they're going to have additional um, DNA tests done on, on it at some point, but I just don't know the status of it. So it's one of those that's kind of up in the air. But as far as uh, Okanagan Lake, that's uh, the Monster Quest thing is the only thing I'm aware of. But maybe you know something I don't know, you know? Well, maybe Corey knows something both of us don't know. We'll have to get around yeah, to asking. Yeah, it's entirely possible. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. But uh, you know, that that I find that interesting, especially if they can come up with something that's uh, compelling. Yeah. You also, know, I... speaking along those lines, in 2001, Bob Rines and his people 
photographed a little carcass-looking object on the bottom of Loch Ness. And when they were filming the Monster Quest episode in 2008, they went to try to refine it to get an actual sample from it to figure out what it was and couldn't retrieve it again, couldn't find it. And apparently it had been eaten or disappeared or something. But uh, the photograph looks like a little plesiosaur. And it's hard to scale. Um, you see the side of an ROV in the image with the carcass. And if the white plastic part you see on the ROV uh, from a different picture is the same object, it's been estimated that it's only a foot long, which conceivably could have been an aborted carcass or something, uh, an aborted fetus, you know? Mm-hmm. But it's certainly an interesting picture, and it really does look like a a little plesiosaur. Well, the sides of, of Loch Ness are so very steep, and, the, and that particular area is rather ragged mm-hmm. and rugged. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the, the dirt and, and silt and what have you washing down from the mountainsides into the lake is, is a constant thing. So yeah. nothing on the bottom that's exposed is going to last long as an exposed anything. Absolutely, uh, and and given a period of six or seven years, you know, it very yeah. well could have yeah. just completely disintegrated or been consumed by uh, scavengers, too. Yes, and, that's and, true. Yeah. So intriguing. Absolutely. Now, do, do you know what, anything about Lake Van in Turkey? Not much. I've only seen the video. Yeah, well, the video that I've seen of the so-called monster in Lake Van was obviously a fraud. Well, that's, uh, that's what a lot of people have told yeah. me. My initial um, opinion, you know, when I first saw it, was it kind of resembled a sturgeon head, and you look like possibly an eye. Mm-hmm. But I've heard a lot of people tell me that they think it's a it's a hoax made with a model. But yeah, I said, well, there were there was too much regular uh, ex- expulsion of. Uh, Mm-hmm. Of uh, bubbles and what have you, and it, you know, the, I think one of the video frames uh, they saw something look like a hose mm-hmm. that was uh, generating the bubbles, yada yada yada. Yeah. But uh, yeah. You know, unfortunately, with the lake monsters, uh, the surgeon's photo being a great example mm-hmm. uh, of the of messy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's just as prone to hoaxers and and frauds and and well, uh, you know, I'm... individuals who want to do things as as our big hairy two legged friend. I'm. Um... I'm one of the few that are inclined to think that maybe the hoax story about the surgeon's photo is the actual hoax, and that it's probably authentic. Because Could most be. of the um, hoax claim regarding the surgeon photo is based on here's secondhand hearsay evidence. You know, there's no real physical evidence to back up the story. Mm, yeah, uh, I think somebody actually recreated it, though. And well, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Boyd and Martin, um, they they used the model, but the model that they have used on several documentaries has been made from uh, styrofoam and balsa wood, not the original materials as claimed by Christian mm-hmm. Sperling, which would have a, a yeah. tin toy submarine in plastic wood. So yeah. in other words, the model that they're using is probably much more stable and buoyant than the original materials coined by Christian Sperling, which a lot of people have found that explanation problematic with the fact that the toy submarines made during that period probably wouldn't have been able to uh, support and stay afloat with those modifications as described by Christian Sperling. So. Well, that too is interesting. So we have mm-hmm. uh, you know, conflicting uh, concepts there. Oh yeah, I mean, and, uh, uh, yeah, of course that, that's made the best case of our PG film print. For it not being uh, a hoax. Mm-hmm. Scott, do you have any books in print? No, I I have several articles that I have written, and they're posted at a website called academia.edu. I think it's www.academia.edu.edu. Edu. Can you give uh, us the titles of them? Uh, perspectives on the living plesiosaur controversy, um, the Cretaceous Pleistocene Wheel of Fortune at Glacial Lake Agassiz and its implications, 
Mosasaurus from Beyond the Grave, um, Night of the Living Dead Plesiosaurus, A Geohistory of the Lake Champlain Basin, Engraved Powder Horn Monsters of the Lake Champlain Region from 1758 to 1760. It's, you know, stuff along those lines. I think you'll Sounds find to it me like our, our our listeners would have a real good read there. <laughs> I believe so, yes. I put a lot oh, of work into Well, you definitely want to look those up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those reworked fossils, plesiosaur fossils I talked about, are in those mm-hmm. articles as well as also some reworked uh, mosasaur material, too. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, when, when, where did you come up with that? Just digging through the paleontology literature, looking for anomalous fossils, particularly marine reptile material. Yeah. Well, they have done, yeah. And now you live on the coast here in Florida, on the west coast, right? Yes, I live on Tampa Bay and Bradenton. Ah, all right. Yep. Well, yeah, you've got quite a few interesting uh, fossil grounds in your backyard there. Oh, absolutely. So, Lots of marine uh, mammal stuff. Oh, for sure. And mm-hmm. uh, then Bone Valley is a little bit further inland, but yep. uh, mm-hmm. you've got uh, some pretty heavy-duty things there, like uh, megalodon. Yep, uh, absolutely. And, uh, uh, I have some whale bones uh, from uh, that area. Mm-hmm. Basilosaurus uh, or something yes, like that? Uh, Basilosaurus. Yeah. I hear they've got a really nice Basilosaurus skeleton at Gainesville. I've been meaning to get over there to check it out. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, you might want to do that because they've got some wonderful things. I, saw, I thought I saw a picture of you with uh, one of the Gainesville uh, uh, giant megalodon jaws. That's at, uh, that South Florida, that's at the South Florida Museum in Bradenton. Oh, that's the old Bishop Museum. Okay, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, but uh, so I mean I'm stuck the location, but yeah, you ought to get up to Gainesville. They've got some oh, really absolutely. cool exhibits up there. Yeah, I definitely and, would uh, want to see their Basilosaurus skeleton. Yeah, if you well if you get a chance to go up there and you want some company, let me know. Oh, I'll, absolutely, uh, yeah. Now they have some cool stuff at the Bradenton Museum. They've got the yeah, uh, I've been there. The manatee, oh, what was it called? Something. The Miocene manatee, the big one. Do a dong. Uh, Are you looking for her name? I'm looking for the Latin name of this manatee from the Miocene. Oh, dear. You've lost me on that one. I've forgotten. And there's also the big 40-foot Miocene crocodile, Gaviola sucus. Mm -hmm. There's a skull of one of those. And it's driving me crazy. I know the name of that Miocene manatee, and I just can't think of it. Uh, hang on, I'll have it here. I've just got to got to look it up real quick because I, I just did a, a fossil book on marine mammals, and yeah. I should remember it off the top of my head. But I'm oh, I know. It. I'm just trying to think of so much stuff. You know, since we're talking right now, it's just I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh dear, I just opened up the book cover and not the book itself. I'm thinking that, it's something helpful. siren. You know, a lot of them like Pisa siren. Oh, yeah, well, the there are siren. Right? Yeah. yeah, they're Sirenians. I know yeah, that. So exactly. Yeah. Okay, here we go. And the name of the Rytina is the modern one. Dolphin. Oh no, Rytina was. Well, do dong rigs. Maxothermium floridinium. Metaxotherium. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. Yeah. Well, they've got the, the bones of one of those, and they've also got the Gaviolosuchus. Yep. And uh, the Megalodon jaws. And they've got Mastodons. And I think I saw, what was the um, the giant armadillo with um, a big mace-looking tail on it? You know what I'm talking about. Yes. Um <laughs> You keep doing that, and I keep my mind keeps going blank. I must be getting Alzheimer's. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I know what you're know exactly yeah. which animal you're Ice talking age. about. Ice age. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, and we do. Yeah. Well, the, the museums down here do have some really cool Miocene, Pleistocene fossils. Oh, absolutely. And and you know one thing I love about Florida, after 18 years in Vermont, are the gators. I've been getting some really cool alligator pictures on a golf course. 
over in uh, yes. Palmetto. I get I only get I only get like 15 feet away from them, but the, you know with a zoom lens it makes it look like I'm standing right on top of them. But well, which is not too bad as long as it isn't mating season. Yeah. And you don't want to get within reach of their tail. <laughs> oh no no no! They can knock you down with their tails. And but, then uh, some. Yeah, and you know you know it's for a short time period. They can run pretty fast, but they run out of gas real oh, no. quick, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't like I don't like messing with them too much. I have a few friends that don't mind wrestling them. Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, like you know. I, I, I don't think I'd be one of them. I'm attracted and repelled at the same time, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm scared to death of them, but I just can't just walk away and leave them, you know. Uh, for I for sure. Well, yeah. there's some really strange things down here. I mean, I don't know if you've ever read the article I did. Uh, for Mysteries Magazine, and uh, actually the story appears in my book, Cryptid Creatures of Florida, too. But uh, the Lake Clinch monster here, which is uh, Lake Clinch is in my backyard uh, outside of Frostproof, mm. uh, Florida. Yeah. And uh, the yeah. animal was uh, you know, a, a serpent-like uh, lake monster. Mm. Uh, I speculate that what it probably was was a giant anaconda. Yeah, uh, there's had... quite a bit of those in South Florida now. Just yeah, well, yes, yeah. they're they're getting around, and we got the boas yeah. too, which makes complicates life. Absolutely, but, uh, and you know, but, uh, where I'm we at know is, we had Mayans here, so the, yeah. you know, the Mayans may have bought the snake up with them because they worship snakes. And yeah, uh, well, you know, I'm, go where here. I'm at, I'm right down the road from the Mayaka preserve where the Mayaka skunk ape photo was taken too. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, very good. I think we've uh, kind of covered it for the night. Cool. And, I, had a, uh, I had a great time. I hope time. our listeners had a good time. I know I had one. I, yeah, me I too. That you did. We'll have Thank to you do for this having again me on. Sometime. Yeah, absolutely. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, until the next time, folks. This is your host, Scott Marlowe, for Creature Zone. Thank you for joining us.